first speaker we have today is Dr. Tom Kulbach. Tom, if you want to start um, bringing your camera up and sharing your screen. Tom works for Applied Research Associates, as I said, and he's the program facility manager of the Onset Wave Tank in Leonardo, New Jersey. He recently retired from ExxonMobil after a career spanning more than 30 years. His focus is often on the subject of the science and regulatory aspects of the use of dispersants during an oil spill. Now, I've asked all of our speakers also to share with me a fun factoid, something they've been doing during COVID or something interesting fact about themselves. And I think you'll, so Tom in high school was a member of the Sudbury, Massachusetts, ancient fife and drum company. And he happened to play the fife. It was the bicentennial time. And so maybe we could hear him doing a little, a little fifing at some point. Uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can see my slide okay. I assume you'll tell me if you can. That looks um, great, Tom. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. <clears throat> so I'm just going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so just talking about dispersants and what they are, what they aren't, you know, what we do with them, some of the aspects of their science and technology, and as it helps with the decision-making process in the event of an oil spill response. So as I mentioned, yeah, my background is in chemistry primarily but I've been doing oil spill response technology for the last uh, 15, 14 years. And now I get the job of working at the Omset test tank. If ever you have a chance to come there, it's certainly a valuable place to come to. The thing I like to start out with is just what are the spill response options? You know, what are the tools that we can use in the event that there is a, now this is generally for a large scale offshore spill that I'm going to be talking about. We understand that most spills are usually fairly small, they're close to shore, they could be in places like marinas where they're very amenable to what we call mechanical containment and recovery. And we hope that that's what you know, happens. You pick it up, you put it back in the container. That's the next best thing over not having a spill in the first place. But in the event that it's fairly large scale, it's offshore, it could be 100 miles away, there are other tools that might have to be brought in to be able to have an effective response in a reasonable time frame. So what I'm going to be talking about today is dispersants, and they can be delivered by vessels, boats. You can bring it on an airplane. There's a 727 there that's shown that OSRL, Oil Spill Response Limited, has two of those in the UK. They can be deployed fairly quickly. Or during Macondo, the Deepwater Horizon Spill Response back in 2010, subsea dispersant injection was used as well. But it's all about trying to minimize the impacts to the environment, and we have something that's called net environmental benefit analysis or spill impact mitigation assessment. They're both meant to look at what you can and can't do and what provides the best uh, option for, again, minimizing environmental impacts. The challenge, though, is how to get out there to do the most you can in the, uh, as quickly as you can. And this is just to give you an idea of what the scale of a spill response offshore could be. This is a picture of uh, some of the oil that was coming up in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2010. An encounter rate is something that we talk about. If you can't get to it with your personnel and your equipment, it doesn't really matter what tool you have because you can't do anything with it. That little quote there by Al Allen, who's been involved in oil spill response for a long time, just as, as, as what's, how do you get there? What's the rate you can encounter to do something with a specific volume to do it as quickly as, can, as you can? Because if you can't get to it, you can't eliminate it. And the picture there is just showing a fairly large scale, probably some sort of a service vessel, supply vessel, transiting through a slick that's actually fairly good size. But if you imagine trying to pick that up in say an eight or 10 hour period, it might be very difficult. Uh, oil spills are not static. Um, you find that very quickly they start moving under their own, but then oceans have currents, there are winds, and before you know it, it starts moving in the, the, the horizontal directions and you start getting some evaporation and other changes but it continuously expands, it gets bigger, it gets thinner, and the challenge of efficiency becomes more so the longer we wait. So the quicker you can get to something, do something with it as close to the source, hopefully the, the most optimal, the best response we can have, again, in a bad situation, but let's get it, uh, let's make it less bad as quickly as possible. So looking at all of the tools we have, it's important to use the combination of whatever we do have. And during the Macondo response, everything was brought. Lots of people, lots of equipment. It took a while, but it was that combination of oil skimmers, dispersant, uh, doing all the work around the wellhead itself, trying to control it. It's always source control is very important. Always though, public safety or the safety of the public and responders is paramount. We will never put people in harm's way knowingly. Uh, if we can do something with mechanical equipment, get it out there as quickly as you can and put it in the thicker oil where it can be more effective, 
but consider those other tools, whether it's in-situ burning, burning in place, or consider dispersant use, because again, the longer you wait, the less effective some of those tools become. But then it's looking at, along with human health, <clears throat> looking at minimizing wildlife exposure, habitat cont contamination, and that could be because oil strands on the shoreline, we want to minimize that as soon as possible. Other things that we can't exclude, especially as we look around the world, there are different uh, drivers that or different communities may have. Sometimes a tour, it's a tourist beach, or it's a marina, or it's fishing, or there are other things that drive what that spill response needs to be. And we need to take that all into account to make sure that we optimize for the specific spill in the specific area. Because I think as we all know, no spill is the same. They all come with their unique challenges and opportunities. So from dispersants, the, uh, the main thing that we look at there is how do they help to remove oil without necessarily mechanically col uh, collecting it and taking it away and doing something with it. It's really through microbial biodegradation. And this uh, cartoon here just shows that on the, uh, this is, oh, let's see. If this is from a sub C standpoint, my slide's slightly different from what I expected. Uh, in fact, if I can, well, I can't move that. Uh, on the surface, you spray it from an aircraft or a boat. Uh, it makes little droplets go into the water column. We'll talk about that in a second. And this diagram here shows what happens when dispersants were added at the subsea wellhead. Uh, and it's really, it's that area here. The, uh, the oil is coming out. You can apply the dispersant directly to it. It makes those small droplets that are out of 50 microns or so, about the width of a human hair. They get colonized pretty quickly by bacteria that are everywhere we've looked that are natural oil degraders. And then in a matter of days to weeks, it actually gets broken down to CO2 and water, and the residual that's left is essentially bio-unavailable, so it's non-toxic. It's still there, but it, it's more like road tar. It's not uh, an active toxic component. But that's what dispersants really do in a nutshell. How do they do it? Uh, they're solutions of surfactants. So imagine like a dish detergent when you're washing dishes and you've got an oily layer on the surface of a, a water in a sink. If you add the detergent to it, all you're trying to do is reduce surface tension and allow the formation of very small droplets that actually go into the water. They don't necessarily dissolve. Some parts might, but they become stabilized droplets that then you can flush off. They can go down the drain. This is sort of the same thing. You have these uh, these chemicals that have a water comp uh, compatible part that's hydrophilic, then there's an oil compatible part, oleophilic or lipophilic. It lines up at the oil water interface and it allows for the formation of these very small droplets. Again, 50 microns or so in size, uh, just some wave energy, very minimal energy allows you to make those droplets. When you have a large slick that doesn't have any dispersant associated with it, it doesn't want to go into the water column. Oil and water don't mix. Here it only mixes because of the physics of the small droplets. But as it goes into large bodies of water, it dilutes rapidly. Typically, we've seen examples of less than part, 10 parts per million within minutes, one part per million within hours, and then almost back to background within a matter of days and weeks. So as it points out, each dispersed oil droplet is an energy source for the microbial community that's there, and they are able to degrade it, some more effectively than others. But within a matter, of, again, of day, uh, hours to days to weeks, it gets degraded fairly quickly. And because it can keep on diluting, it's essentially without what we call nutrient or oxygen limits. If you do it in a closed container, the, the biodegradation actually consumes the oxygen and whatever nutrients, whether it's phosphorus or nitrogen, that once that's limited, the bacteria can't work anymore. But in an open water environment, it can keep on diluting to almost that level uh, that can be sustained with what's actually in the water column. So toxicity. The dilution actually helps a lot. So we know that oil has compounds within it. The surfactants that are in the dispersants and the solvents, they have some toxicity as well. We'll talk about that. But in the top part of the water in that first hour, we've seen measurements of maybe up to a couple hundred parts per million. But again, within hours, back down to that sort of part per million level where the toxicity becomes less of an issue. If you look at some standard tests that are done for toxicity measurements, they're typically done in the lab in a set volume for a set amount of time, and that doesn't really represent what happens in the real world where there's a high potential for dilution. So there might be a spiked exposure, but within, again, hours, it drops down fairly quickly. There was concern during the Macondo response uh, back in 2010 that this one surfactor, this one dispersant that was being used is called Corexit 9500. <clears throat> it was a product of a commercial company, and it wasn't necessarily freely uh, told what was in it. And there was some public concern about what might be in there that could be dangerous. 
After a while, the company that was manufacturing, its name was Nalco, did put out the list of what the components are. And there are what are called four surfactants. Uh, they're listed here in the table over here on the left, on the right, then a, and then a couple of solvents. But the main thing is they were chosen because of their inherent low toxicity based on experience in lots of different marketplaces. So these were actually materials that had been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, and again, had relatively low toxicity and were in things like shampoos, baby bath, mouthwashes, face lotions, wetting agents, all sorts of things. So the chances are that who's ever on the, the call listening today has probably been exposed to one or other component of a commercial dispersant to some extent, again, in low concentrations, but the, the toxicity issues are less than people were afraid of. And it was partly because of that lack of transparency and sharing information freely in the early days of the Macondo response. So NOAA and the Food and Drug Administration did do testing of seafood in the Gulf of Mexico 2010 and thereafter. Thousands of samples, both came back non-detectable and where they could detect any sort of contaminant, it was below the threshold of concern. And it says there's no question that Gulf seafood coming to the market back then was safe for consumption. Another study that was done several years back by Environment Canada was just looking at commercial dish detergents compared to these two commercial uh, corrected products. And in the case of toxicity, the lower number is actually a higher toxicity. It just means you use less material to drive what's called this lethal concentration that kills 50% of the test organisms. In this case, it was a rainbow trout. So dish soaps were on the order of 10 to 20 times more toxic in this test than corrected 9500, which was the primary dispersant that was used during Deepwater Horizon. So surface application is primarily where dispersants have been used. So there might be a spill 50 miles offshore, you can come in with a vessel spray, and it's usually at about a 5% loading compared to the spilled oil. So if you had 100 gallons of oil spill, you'd put five gallons of oil on it. So it's a small percentage. During Deepwater Horizon early on, they looked at the possibility of doing the subsea dispersant injection, where they could actually put a tube 5,000 feet down, because that's how deep the well was, and inject that right into the wellhead that was leaking at a set amount. It was around 10 or 12 gallons per minute. Before they could do that, though, the EPA wanted to see proof that this was a viable method. So there was a test done on May 9th and May 10th back in 2010, and this just highlights some of the aerial photographs that were taken before and after. The water, the oil droplets that would come out of the well would take on the order of five to seven hours to rise through that 5,000 feet of depth before you could see it on the, the water surface. So the picture in the upper left is with no dispersant application. In the yellow circle is a drilling rig, it's probably one of the ones that was doing one of the relief wells. Uh, and it's just in these other three pictures, just shows what the slick looked like that was coming up basically every day, 24 hours a day. When they started injecting dispersants on May 10th, within three hours, there's that rig and we started to see a, a drop off in the amount. After 11 hours, so in theory, a lot had been they should have still seen oil coming up if it wasn't being treated, but there was a significant drop off. In fact, the person who took these photographs said he thought they had capped the well because it looked like 90% of the oil was not actually being expressed on the water surface. When they stopped after five hours, you started to see the slip coming back. The wind actually changed through all of these, but the magnitude was about the same, so it's not that it's just blowing it to one side or another. But based on that, the proof of concept appeared to be valid. And dispersant was injected subsea for a number of days. You may have heard 1.8 million gallons of dispersants were applied during the response. 700,000 of those were subsea. 1.1 million were applied on the surface, either at the around the wellhead expression or to actually help drive oil away from the responders because of the, uh, the volatile organics that come along with an oil. It doesn't smell very good, and if you're in it for a fairly long period of time, you may start suffering some. Um, ill consequences like a lightheadedness or a nausea. So it's good not to expose people to that. So there are a couple of things that we heard following. In the 10 years, we've worked a lot with the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. We've worked with Oil Spill Response Limited and other responders, the American Petroleum Institute, to try to develop materials to address some of the issues and concerns that people have had. But we know that dispersants can be used effectively, but there's a poor understanding in a lot of either regulatory agencies or the public about what they do or don't do. And there were some misunderstandings. One was dispersants are simply used to, move, to remove the oil, to hide it. In reality, dispersants do take it away from the oil surface, but it's not to hide it. It's to make small droplets that then can be biodegraded much more effectively. 
than if we left it as a, as a slick floating on the surface. Another is that it's just a cheap alternative and there are better things to do. As we talked about, there are you know, the other tools. Mechanical containment recovery is one that we generally see as the most viable option for most spills. And again, we'd like to do that. But to try to get equipment 100 miles offshore to do things where weather may come into play, it's not always the most efficient use. So cheapness, expense has nothing to do with oil spill response. We just want to do it as effectively as possible. So for near shores, mechanical containment recovery can potentially be the best thing. Large scale offshore dispersants should be considered. Uh, dispersants just add another toxic chemical to an already polluted sea. Everything has toxicity, but in the tests that have been done, it's generally seen that modern dispersants are less toxic than the oil that they're actually dispersing. So the main thing we need to focus on is the toxicity of the oil that we're putting into the water column and try to mitigate that. And yes, and we understand there are going to be cases where you wouldn't put it in the water column, depending on what kind of species might be below where you're dispersing. If there had been a, a, a fish spawn the right there, you would not want to do it because they're at a very sensitive life stage. But the main thing is that since 1967, when there was a spill off the UK called the Torrey Canyon, they used harsh degreasing solvents. And that's sometimes listed as an example of bad dispersants, but it was not a modern dispersant. Over the last couple of years, the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine, NASM, finished a, uh, a report on the use of dispersants in marine oil, spa, oil spill response. They had done one in 2005 and they did one in 1989. I was involved in this one. Um, and it was really looking at the state of the science since 2010, although this was not meant to be a Deepwater Horizon retrospective. But the main thing is did see that surface and subsurface dispersant application could be a useful tool. And then we always like to say, when used appropriately, and then that's with the right PPE, the personal protective equipment, putting it in the right place where it can have dilution and considering what else might be there, it can be a good tool, especially for reducing response personnel to those volatile organics that I talked about. And then the oiled area on the floating surface that uh, organisms, uh, marine mammals might see, you can reduce that quite a bit and hopefully minimize the exposure to sensitive shorelines which in the Gulf of Mexico, essentially all shorelines where oil washed up could considered, be considered to be sensitive. And if they can shorten the duration of the spill, instead of having floating oil for months, where it may wash up on a beach and then stay there for months to years, if we can minimize that to weeks to maybe months and have an overall positive impact on worker and community health, that could be a, a very positive thing. And really try and understand what dispersants can do. Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative has spent a lot of time and money with some laboratory experiments and also doing stuff with modeling that help us understand the science even better. So the main things are that dispersant application represents a useful tool. When used appropriately, you can do those things that I talked about, minimize exposure to both people and the environment, shorten the, the spill impact, which is certainly good, and then just understanding it as much as we can. So a lot of time has been spent. Um, Part of my job over the last 10 years has been giving talks like this to the public in general, but also working with regulators, because the more we can build that area of understanding and trust around what a spill response is, is really key, because it doesn't do us much good if we're at cross purposes trying to do the right thing. And I think we all agree that we want to minimize impact to the, uh, basically, the environment, but it's the ecosystem and everything that we do in the Gulf or anywhere else around the world that derives benefit from that ecosystem. And we work in uh, Asia, Africa, Europe, South America. We've been involved in lots of different areas talking to people to try to understand how to do things better. And I'm always happy to talk uh, anywhere. I don't think that there's ever a bad question. And I know I'm a little bit early, but I'm going to give some time back and I'll be happy to answer questions at the very end. And I'd just like to thank you for listening.